Welcome, everybody, on behalf of the Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern, and I am an educator at the museum. And this afternoon, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Paul Kester, a Holocaust survivor from Germany who will share his story with you. And afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Before we begin, I would like to share a quick history of our museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that future generations could always remember and learn from this tragic history. They did this at a time um, in the early 1960s when most survivors were not yet willing to relive their trauma, largely because the public was not yet ready to listen to them. But thanks to the courage and foresight of this group of survivors, we have what became the first and oldest Holocaust museum in the United States, always with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. We can't do the work that we do today without our survivor community who still on a regular basis shares their stories with groups to make sure that our future will always be able to learn from this part of our history. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us today and for everything that you do for our community by sharing your story on such a regular basis. As a reminder to the audience afterwards, you can use the Q&A box to ask questions afterwards and we'll answer as many as possible. Thank you so much for being with us today, Paul, and thank you to our audience for joining in. And you may begin. You may want to know, who am I, what am I? I belong to a tiny, minority, a very tiny minority of Jewish children born in Europe after the First World War, who were still alive at the end of the Second World War. You see, when we talk about the Holocaust, we always refer to the murder of six million Jews by the Nazis during the years of the Second World War. What, what is not often sufficiently emphasized is that among the six million, there were one and a half million children, 1,500,000 children. I was not one of them. I was lucky. So let me tell you my story. I was born in a town called Wiesbaden in West Germany, near Frankfurt, in 1925. I was six or seven years old when Hitler came to power. Now, for a child at that age, you don't get too much affected by what's going on in the adult world. But I remember that all of a sudden in town, there was large signs, and I could read already, that it proclaimed, the Jews are our enemies, the Jews are criminals, the Jews are thieves, the Jews have caused us to lose the First World War. And for me at the time, this was difficult to understand because my parents, my grandparents, my relatives, and other many Jewish friends, they were no criminals. So it was my first exposure <clears throat> to government propaganda to pursue its ideology, the Nazi ideology, 
uh, proclaiming that the Germans are members of a master race and that all other races are inferior and the Jewish race the most inferior of all. Now, to put things in proportion, Wiesbaden had a population of about 300,000. It included a relatively small Jewish community of about 3,000, or barely 1%. Also in Germany, in 1933, when Hitler came to power, the Jewish population in Germany at the time was about 600,000. Again, among a population of 65 million, or barely 1%. Now it's hard to fathom that such a tiny minority could be such an evil element that the Aryans, the Germans, had to restrict their lives and to pursue their propaganda, as I described. <clears throat> now, of course, this change affected the adults. My, I was a member of a family, parents, grandparents. I had a sister who was two years older. And it was a happy childhood. And frankly, it, my level, I was not affected by the sudden change and restrictions that the new government, the Nazi government, imposed upon its Jews. I went to elementary school for four years. I was just, I was the only Jewish boy in class. I felt no different. I did not look any different. The only difference between me and the other boys were that if we went to church, I went to synagogue. The other kids went to the Catholic or Protestant churches in town. It, when I was 10 years old in 1936, it was under the then prevailing system. It had to be decided if I should continue uh, elementary school or start high school. Being a good student, my father enrolled, tried to enroll me in high school. And in this one at the time, there were three boys' gymnasiums. Uh, girls and boys in those days went to separate schools. The first school we went to, the principal told my father that the school was 100% Nazi. He could not assume responsibility for the safety of his child. And that was effectively a refusal. The second school had some other excuse. The third school did accept me. And also my friend Leo, with whom I had grown up. And now we were two Jewish boys in high school. Again, teachers and students did not harass us, did not uh, make us feel uncomfortable. We were all more involved with pursuing our studies, our sports, and whereas the boys in the class, non-Jewish, after school, were active in the Hitler Youth, Leo, my friend Leo and I, we belonged to the Jewish sports club, to a Jewish social club, and I felt quite <clears throat> 
undisturbed by what was going on. Yes, there was talk about emigration. I had two cousins who in the early, in 1933 or 34, uh, left Germany. One could not pursue his university studies, the other not his business career. So they were single and uh, left Germany. As some other people did, but for most of us, life continued in its usual course. Uh, my family had a large clothing store in the center of town. And to give all that up, to try to get to another country, if another country would let you in, with no resources, the Nazis would not let you take along anything of value, no money. Uh, for a family, that was a decision uh, that you hesitated to make as long as you had a reasonable chance to lead a normal life. But <clears throat> by 1938, it became more uh, pertinent to pursue emigration. My uh, parents approached relatives in New York if they could provide affidavits of support which were needed in order to gain uh, legal immigration status to the United States. Uh, these relatives said they could not do it for the family, but were willing to take one of us children, my sister being the older one, got her permit. And in the summer of 1938, my mother took her to Hamburg, the German port. And in those days, one traveled by boat. Off she went to an unknown destination to an unknown future, but away from the uncertainties and dangers that Nazi rules and regulations that threatened Jewish life in Germany. My life continued pretty much undisturbed. That summer, I traveled a lot visiting relatives, in Germany, I came back, went back to school, no changes. Usual after school activities, sports, private lessons, uh, going to the movies, and have a typical life of a little boy at the age now of 12 years. And then in November 1938, Leo and I were in class at a regular lecture, which was interrupted by an official of the school coming in and telling him and me to go home, that there were problems. Well, we did as we were told. We went home and I found my mother and my grandmother who lived with us quite visibly upset. Uh, they had been trying to go to our store and which was about a 15 minute walk from the apartment where we lived. And when they were supposed to pass the large synagogue on their way, they saw it was in flames. And they also noticed that some German, some Jewish stores were being vandalized. What happened was when my father, who tried to open the store earlier, found a large masses of uh, human of the people in front of the store, very much involved in smashing the many large display windows the many glass shelves and cabinets containing the merchandise. Two police policemen were watching it, 
but not interfering, but rather asking my father to come with him. He sidestepped his way through the crowds and went into hiding. What happened that day was the start of a major pogrom in Germany against the Jews. Well over 1,000 synagogues were being burned. Still existing Jewish stores were vandalized, smashed and destroyed. All men between the ages of 16 and 65 were arrested and sent to concentration camps. A huge special tax was imposed upon the Jews which basic, and basically wiped out what resources they still possessed at that time. It was obviously the beginning of the end for Jewish life in Germany and ultimately for Jews in Europe. Next day, Leo and I go back to school, but we're called to the principal's office, who told us that from now on, no Jewish children were allowed to attend German schools. Well, that was the end of my education in Germany. Uh, I think that evening my father came back, supposedly the arrests had stopped, but at almost nine o'clock in the evening, the doorbell rings to our apartment. I open it. A man in civilian clothing identifies himself as a member of the secret police, the Gestapo, and orders my father to come with him. Within minutes, my father is gone. My mother tells me, get on your bike, go to our friends tell them that the arrests are still going on. I remember that dismal November night when I did as I was told. And what happened then, my mother and I had to clean up the store. The store that had been destroyed by the German Nazis. It took us two weeks to clean up the mess. For days on end, I was gathering up broken glass and I remember sometimes at night I couldn't sleep. I had that noise of broken glass, dazzling it. Excuse me. Excuse me. And during those weeks, I remember the desperation, the fear the, the, uh, of the adults, not knowing what would happen to the men. My mother and I, after my father was arrested, the next day we went to the police to find out where is my father? We didn't get an answer. But a few days later, we learned that he was with other Jewish men sent to Dachau, a concentration camp in Southern Germany. A concentration camp that continued to exist until the end of the Second World War when it was liberated by American troops. 
And every day there were new news, bad news. We learned that a cousin of mine in his early 20s, who had been taken to the concentration camp of Buchenwald, had been had died there. Later on, we learned that the guards had beaten him to death. Another relative, cousin of my grandmother, he died. And some other men, fathers, her brothers, her sons, of people we knew, also did not survive the ill treatment. I remember I was told one day I should go to the central station that some men were returning from the camps. Maybe my father was among them. Well, I did as I was told. He was not among them, but I saw the men who came back. These were middle-aged, were elderly men, businessmen, lawyers, doctors. To see them in their present stage was quite shocking. Dirty, emaciated, starved, visible signs of ill treatment. These were all events that impacted my life, my childhood, until the beginning of the pogrom had been relatively happy and undisturbed. But all of a sudden, I was faced with the uncertainty that the adults had to go through. And I remember that during that time, I had fear, first time in my life, fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what might still happen. Now, emigration became not a question of choice, but a question of survival. But no country would take us. And whatever efforts were made, nothing seemed to work. But then, we learned that some countries would take children, Jewish children from Germany. England opened its borders for 10,000. Uh, France, Belgium, Holland, Switzerland took a few. As a matter of fact, my friend Leo, who had relatives in Amsterdam, was able to go there. He left on December 7th, barely one month after the start of the program. I bid him goodbye at the central station, railroad station in Wiesbaden. I wished him well. And I felt left behind. Some days later, after four weeks, my father did return from the concentration camp. He was in relatively good physical and mental condition. Uh, somehow he had managed to withstand the harsh treatment uh, he had to suffer in the camp. And now all of a sudden we get a letter from a distant relative in Sweden. Sweden was willing to take 500 Jewish children from Germany. And this relative was a teacher at a Jewish boarding school. That school was allocated, I think about 30 of those 500 children. My relative put me on the list. And within a couple of days, I get a letter from the Swedish embassy in Berlin, Germany's capital, writing that a permit for me was available. 
that eliminated my name from all other, from lists to any other country. And obviously Sweden was going to be my destination. And I guess my destiny. How soon can I go? I know that we learned that to England, they had organized children transports, but none of that seemed to exist to Sweden. So I was told, just take a train and go there. Last minute visits to relatives to say goodbye. I remember the Christmas day of 1938, being with my relatives, their stores destroyed, their livelihood taken away from them. The men returned from the camps an atmosphere desperate and dep depressing. Uh, back in Wiesbaden, my personal belongings had to be packed and sent ahead to Sweden. And line, Alan. Call from and my personal belongings had to be packed under the supervision of a police official to make sure that I did not take along anything of value. On the 9th of January, 1939, two months after the start of the pogrom, I bid my family goodbye. Last words of encouragement, expressing the hope of a, an early reunion. And off I go, a train from Wiesbaden to Berlin, about a seven hour ride. I get to Berlin, I stay with a cousin. We go to the Swedish embassy. And after a couple of days of complying with certain red tape, I do get my Swedish permit stamped into my uh, identification papers. And on the 15th of January, 1939, again, I go by train through Northern Germany. I am now 13 years old, traveling alone. And there was one question was I as a child allowed to take the sum of the equivalent of $10 with me, which was all committed for adult use. In order not to run any risks, I spend the money in the dining car. And now I'm quite content to travel is about the equivalent of five cents in my pocket uh, to a foreign country where I didn't know the language. But my ambition was to get out. Last minute inspection by police in black uniform, the secret police inspecting my little hand luggage. 
a book, last minute gift. He inspected and said no books allowed. He confiscated it, I couldn't care less. Eventually the train, after quite a few hours, train ride through Northern Germany, arrives at the port of the Baltic Sea, German port. I see an ocean for the first time. The train now gets on a ferry. The ferry takes us on a four hour ride to Southern Sweden. And I remember on this January afternoon, as a ferry slowly moves, leaving the German port, and I saw the German coastline slowly disappearing on the horizon. I felt a tremendous sense of relief. Relief that I had escaped, that I had gotten out of a country where it was now a crime to be Jewish. I get to Sweden, I go to a boarding school. I join 60 other children, similar background, also, also Jewish children from Germany, similar background of mine. The kids become my new family. And after two years, I get to another children's home and start Swedish high school until the age of 16. Then there were no resources left for my further education. I was under the auspices of the small Jewish community of Stockholm. But I got a job there, an office job, and could go to, I got to Stockholm, where I could go to night school. Now at 16, I was my own, uh, responsible only to myself. I basically joined adult life. And even though some of the, those years, the six years that I lived in Stockholm, especially the early years during the war, were challenging and um, also lack of money, but I was my own boss and I managed. Now, how did I stay in touch with my relatives, with my family in Germany? When we wrote letters, I wrote letter to my parents every week and they wrote to me. And even when the war started in September of 1939, when the Germans invaded Poland and started the Second World War, postal connections between Germany and Sweden, Sweden being a neutral country, functioned pretty much undisturbed. Yes, letters, all letters were censored by the Nazi authorities to make sure that nothing was written that could reflect negatively on the Nazi Germans, reflect negatively uh, being read by Swedish people. The war years were challenging. <clears throat> Sweden was surrounded by Denmark, Norway, all occupied by, by Germany. But we followed the events of the war closely. We admired 1940, England's fortitude to withstand the Blitz. We welcomed the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union 
And even though they seemed victorious there too, but by the end of 1941, the Nazi war machine stalled in front of Moscow. <clears throat> and at the same time, I remember I was in this children's room, one of the adults coming and telling me, telling us I had to slept in a room with uh, nine other boys. Japan has, a, Japan has attacked the United States. For us, it was a relief. Now, Germany had to face not only England and the British Empire and the vast land masses and population of the Soviet Union, but now also being faced with the enormous resources that the United States brought towards the ultimate defeat of Germany and Japan. <clears throat> In 1942, now three years into the war, we learned that Jews still in Germany started being deported to ghettos and camps in Eastern Europe. And my parents wrote to me that they had to leave in August of 1942. They had to leave their apartment in Wiesbaden and were transported to a ghetto town in what is now the Czech Republic, a ghetto town called Theresienstadt. They were not sure that we could stay in contact, but I sent to them cards with return receipts, registered mail. And within days, I got their signature, new address. Again, the Nazis in the midst of war, observing postal regulations. They could write short letters to me and I could write to them. But after five months, my letters to them come back, returned with a stamp that read, no longer here. And I knew that was bad news because transports from Theresienstadt of Jews from there went towards Poland. And we knew that living conditions in the ghettos or camps in Poland were of very limited chance to survive. We did not know the full extent, but later on I learned that my parents had been in a transport from Theresienstadt in January of 1943 to Auschwitz, and all members of the transport, 2,000 Jews, were immediately murdered and gassed upon their arrival. My grandmother stayed on for another year, but died in Theresienstadt of mistreatment and starvation, which in a way was a blessing because she would have been scheduled for transport to Auschwitz not much later. <clears throat> the war ended in 1945. Europe was pretty much destroyed. In Sweden, I had a relatively good life. I have good memories. But in 1948, I decided to leave Europe. I did not like the encroachment of Eastern Europe by the Soviet Union. I did not like the limited possibilities for a career in Sweden at the time. 
I did not like the overall conditions in Europe destroyed and slow in getting back on its feet. So I came to this country, to the United States. And I came after a short visit back east in early 1949 to Los Angeles. I got married. I married my wife I had met 10 years earlier when we were children in Sweden. We have lived here in Los Angeles ever since for the last 74 years. I again went to school to pursue an education. I became a certified public accountant. I had a challenging, demanding, stimulating career. And we were happy to be able to create for ourselves a normal life, a normal life that was taken from us in our childhood. And now, almost 97 years old, I can look back with a great deal of good feelings. I was lucky. I was lucky that my parents were willing to depart, let their children depart, not knowing if they would ever see them again. I was lucky that I got to a neutral country, not overrun by the, the Nazi war machine. My friend Leo was less lucky. Holland was occupied by the Nazis. And in 1942, he too was deported to Auschwitz and murdered there. I was lucky that I had a nice family life, a wonderful wife. a son and daughter-in-law, grandchildren, granddaughters. And I guess I had, I still enjoy relatively good health. I must have had good genes. And I welcome the opportunity to talk to people about my life, about a childhood that was shattered, but a life that was regained. I thank you for listening and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box. And while we um, are thinking of some questions, I wanted to share some photos with everyone. That's my father. my mother. Here I am about 12 years old, shortly before I got out of Germany to Sweden.
you. I'll share a couple more later. Um, the We do have some questions. First question is, have you ever been back to Germany? I have been back quite a few times. Uh, my first visit was in 1947, when I still lived in Sweden. And um, I saw Germany thoroughly destroyed, which gave me a certain sense of satisfaction. But what happened in subsequent years, I realized, whereas in the early years I suspected Nazis in every adult, in later years I realized that a new generation had grown up. As a matter of fact, I was asked about my story by a teacher at the school where that I had attended high school in Wiesbaden about my story and also what had happened to the Jewish students still at the time at the school. It developed into a correspondence. They were putting a book together, uh, faculty and uh, upper level students about education at the Nazi school. And it also contained my story. And it so happened that my wife and I could attend the publication of that book. Uh, at that time, <clears throat> I also was asked to address German students. This was about 1990, uh, about 50 some years uh, after the end of the war. And it was quite an experience. Uh, to have today's uh, students ask me questions, including asking, are we guilty? How do you answer that? I said, well, you're not guilty what happened during the lifetime of your grandparents, or more likely your grand great grandparents, but you have an ob obligation to know the history of your country, to make sure it doesn't happen again, to make sure that you protect the democracy, the freedom uh, that you enjoy, that you fight anti-Semitism, intolerance, and don't, don't hate. Which is incidentally a message I also leave to students that I quite often address in this country. So um, I realized after many years that Germany had new generations. And I hope that they protect the freedom that they enjoy, as I hope that the youngsters that, that I talk to do the same in this country. Thank you um, for sharing. What happened to your sister and at what point did you reconnect with her? My sister came to New York, stayed with relatives, <clears throat> with relatives. She was 14 at the time, uh, finished high school, went to work. <clears throat> 1945, uh, she was 22 years old, got married, and I met her again in 1946, we had not seen each other for eight years, uh, grown up into adulthood. 
under quite different conditions, but we shared a common childhood. And the loss of family and she and her family, they all lived here in Los Angeles and we maintained a close family relationship. I am the only survivor of my generation, but I'm still close to nephews and nieces and their children. Thank you. What was your wife's story? Did she have a similar experience? My wife was born in Berlin, Germany, came to Sweden a few years before me. Uh, her mother perished in Auschwitz. The father <clears throat> managed to get to Sweden and live there. Her story is, her background is similar to mine. We shared the upheaval that occurred during our early years. And um, what I mentioned before, we were fortunate, we were lucky to be able to settle in this country, in California. We loved to live here. It was so much different from Europe, so much better so much positive and constructive in many ways. And I treasure the memory of my 68 years with my wife. And my memories now of those happy years are always a source of good feeling. It sustains me and makes my current life worthwhile. Thank you so much. What do you think the scariest part of your experience was? The scariest part were the two months starting with the pogrom in November of 1938. The um, sudden change of everything that I was used to, the sudden end of my childhood, in effect. Uh, I was thrown in with the concerns and the worries and the unhappiness of the adults. It was, as I mentioned before, a two months of suffering from fear, a time of trauma and drama, and I lived only the moment I left Germany, a country where my family had lived for centuries. As a matter of fact, you could trace back our ancestry to the year 1400, all living in West Germany, all benefiting by the emancipation and assimilation 
that happened during the later years of the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century until the sudden end of it by the Nazis coming to power and pursuing its evil ideology. Those two months were the only time in my life, I guess, that I was scared, scared of the unknown. Thank you. Do you still have the letters from your parents? Yes, I have their letters. And they are um, filmed and kept by copies in Germany are being read at certain occasions of remembrance. The letters <clears throat> make interesting reading, especially since quite a few sections are blacked out. I try to figure out what was written under the black uh, cover that the Nazis had applied the census. I took it some years ago to a division of the Los Angeles Police Department where they had a machine that could read uh, what was written under a cover, uh, probably similar to an X-ray machine. And I looked through the machine, I could see that the Nazis were rather thorough in what they did. They did not cover the writing. They somehow chemically wiped it out. Those documents are still in my possession, but copies of it are being used by Jewish museums and German uh, institutions. Thank you for sharing. Do you remember how the relative was related in Sweden? You mentioned a distant relative. Do you know what the relation was? Uh, yes. The teacher's lady was a niece of my grandfather's brother's wife. So it's rather remote. I guess you might say a cousin of a cousin. But um, we knew this lady from Germany. She had been visiting in Wiesbaden quite a few times. And <clears throat> when there was a chance of putting names uh, of kids on the list, she and some other teachers did what they did. It saved my life. And I'm glad to say that uh, she too and her husband eventually settled in California. And um, I maintain a very close relationship with her over the years. You. Did you have any other relatives who survived, like any cousins or um, yeah. anyone? My father had several siblings, 
and one brother was married to a Catholic non-Jewish lady. And because of that, he was not deported from Germany to the camps right away, but had some special <clears throat> uh, ex uh, permission to stay in his home. But in February 1945, he was sent to the but extermination had terminated. Those camps had been already liberated by the Soviet Union, and he survived. Uh, he and his family, uh, we became quite close. We visit them quite often, and they have visited us here. Now, the, over the second or third generation. Um, but I always marvel at that uh, the Nazis still had time to take him from his village and ship him off to Theresienstadt in February of 1945. When the Allies, British and Americans, were within a hundred miles of the small village where he lived, the obsession to kill Jews, or at least to isolate them, uh, was a primary objective of Nazi Germany, even at a time when they barely had the resources to keep, to maintain a front which was rapidly crumbling because by May of 1945, there was the complete collapse of Germany and followed by occupation. The, uh, and some other cousins and relative family members that did get out of Germany before the war settled uh, in the United States, England. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> my wife and I had relatives in any number of countries from Sweden to England to Ireland to Spain to New Zealand to United States, Canada, South America, you name it. It's a story of those who survived and managed to escape to some place of uh, refuge. We were good at maintaining contact with most of them. Uh, it, same as the kids that we grew up in Sweden. Uh, many of them stayed in Sweden. Many of them went to Israel. Many of them came to this country. And it was always a special event to get reunited with them on our travels to these countries, especially to Israel, or have them visit us here in Los Angeles. At what point did you and your wife share with your children and grandchildren um, your life experiences? We have one son. He's our only child. And he grew up knowing that he had no grandparents. He knew that they had been killed. 
As a matter of fact, he now, he's in his late 60s, is very active. He lives back east and is very active in uh, Jewish life in, his, in Buffalo, where he lives. And has traced our family background and um, two daughters, he has two daughters. They all grew up knowing their background and accepting or being able to keep the memory alive of those who perished and also being active in their lives through organizations or other commitments, working towards a more peaceful society and thereby adding, uh, doing something for their future and the future of mankind. I always express the hope when I talk to young people, young people who are going to or are the citizens of the 21st century, that they remember what happened during the first half of the 20th century and make sure that events that happened then remain unique in the history of mankind. One sometimes wonders how successful that's going to be. Looking at today's news, I never thought that there would be another major war in Europe. For me, it's quite a shock and disappointment. What's happening in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine? And I also kind of feel bad about some movements in many countries becoming more right wing, more uh, conservative or authoritarian. I see it in countries like uh, Hungary, Poland. I see a right-wing party taking power in Italy, a large right-wing party gaining votes in Sweden, in France, in Germany. And I see certain right-wing elements in this country, which I regret and fear and hope that humanity will maintain some level of rational conduct and not engage in destruction of others or self-destruction. I hope for the best and I, whoever is listening here to me today, 
I wish you well. I say don't hate, be tolerant. And try to build a more perfect society. so much for sharing with us today and all the times that you share this story and this message particularly to students on such a regular basis because uh, you help our future generations understand the importance of building a better world so we thank you so much for everything that you do for our community Thank you to our audience for tuning in and for your attention and questions. We hope to see you next Thursday. Um, thank you so much again, Paul, and everybody who watched. And we wish you well and a good, happy, healthy new year. Thank you. Thank and you. Goodbye. Thank you.